at our schedule. I'm just going to drop this into the um, chat. For your convenience. And um, have a look at uh, where we are, where we've been and where we're going. OK, so for the past few weeks, I've been going through this uh, R Stats Bootcamp. What is the Bart R Stats Bootcamp, you may ask? If you haven't been for the last few sessions, the R Stats Bootcamp is a resource. It's designed to be completely self led. But uh, as you know, sometimes it's difficult to get the motivation or to get started for a purely online self led things, especially technical things like R. And I'm, I'm very aware of that and everything. So these sessions are meant to um, to help build some uh, inertia, some momentum. If you if you uh, have been thinking about using R for a while, and they're a complete review for for all beginners of all levels um, to allow you to to start and practice the basics of the R language as a programming language, but also to use it to do the stuff you want to do with it. Um, the boot camp encompasses basic statistics, traditional statistics, um, analysis of variance and um, regression and all of that kind of fun stuff and creating graphs, reading your data in, all of that kind of stuff. So it's meant to be a, a gateway to doing that. It has another function and I realize I haven't emphasize this other function. But uh, for some of us, this other function is very important. And that's just to create a community. We see each other's faces. We have people that are doing the same thing at approximately the same time, uh, week to week. And it's just nice to have that. So thanks and welcome. So uh, the other thing I want to mention, especially for the new folks, is that at that link that I drop in there, um, it turns out that today's meeting is our 139th meeting <laughs> since I have uh, joined Harper. We started off with these a long time ago, meeting monthly, and uh, there has been demand from the very beginning to go weekly. And so when uh, my schedule can bear that, we have done weekly meetings. Uh, so we've done that for a long time, and we'll, we'll continue to do it at least for the boot camp section, and then we'll see what happens for the rest of the term. We're on boot camp section four, but don't let that deter you from um, sticking around today. Uh, we have the links from previous sessions. I've gone through several iterations of the website, so this goes back uh, for some time. I don't know how long it goes back, but um, well, it goes back to um, September 2022, so it goes back a good ways. On each of these entries, We've had a meeting, and uh, for most of them, there is um, the resources. Some of them have quite a lot of resources like code, data, slides, um, maybe links to other resources. And for some of them, there is a YouTube video as well that you can you can click to watch the old meetings. I think that's all I need to say by way of introduction. Um, I notice now that I didn't update the um, the uh, GitHub uh, link. Maybe I'll just show you this world really quickly <laughs> for uh, for this. Um, this is what GitHub Desktop looks like. I, I wrote this whole website, and all of this stuff is is written in R. And uh, I had updated for today's, but I didn't um, I didn't uh, actually update the the website from my computer to GitHub so that the web page page would change. So let me do that really quick. What this page is, is a, an account of files that changed that I changed to set up for today. I'm going to pause my Dropbox or the computer will cry and everyone may see a grown man cry. I hate it when my Dropbox um, messes things up. I'm going to commit all of my changes because I'm very sure that I intend to make them. And uh, when that commits, I'm going to push my changes up to GitHub. If this is all a new world to you with GitHub, you, you can close your eyes and hum. It's almost over. OK, there we go. And in a few minutes, when I click Go, I wanted to do this because I know some people like to follow along with the slides on their own computer. Um, and I like to include the people that, uh, that do that. So we'll give it just a few moments. 
can hold down control and click refresh. It's not updated yet, but it'll it will do so in just a few seconds. I'm very impatient, you see, so I'll just um, continue blithely clicking my browser, hoping for a change in the universe. Maybe I can affect things in some small way. <clears throat> and there it is. So um, if you just refresh your own browser, you'll see that the, the meeting is up. I'll just make this a little bit bigger for everyone. And um, this is the boot camp link for the page we're going through today. Um, but I usually start these off with a little bit of slides by way of introduction, just to prove to myself it works. I'll just open the ones from the link. And uh, there we go. We've got it. I didn't update the um, the, the date today. Um, and I see some of my headings I didn't update because I was doing it so quickly because I have this short course running. But there you go. So our splash page, I'm going to maximize and then I will begin. Okay, because I know there are a few people here that are new. Um, don't it's very informal. Don't hesitate to uh, stop me. This is just to give you the idea of the concepts introduced into this bootcamp page, and then we will go and I'll show you the bootcamp page and do a little bit of live coding during this introduction. For those of you who haven't attended before, I wanted to talk a little bit about the symbology in the uh, this year's bootcamp poster. The rubber duck is uh, a reference to um, rubber duck debugging, debugging, or um, some people call it rubber ducking. And uh, this is the process of while you're trying to solve some problem with code, we often, anybody will find uh, that they come upon some obstacles and a method to overcome the obstacles. Let's say you're trying to do something complicated like um, make a model or uh, do some kind of complicated statistic. And there, there are several steps that are required. And, Maybe you don't know all of the steps. Well, a method to break it down is to uh, break the problem down into small steps as if you're you're talking to an imaginary friend. Like a, maybe you have a little rubber duck toy, a bath time duck toy on your desk. And uh, if you can explain the steps that are required to solve your problem to the rubber duck, you're rubber ducking. And uh, the idea is that this will help you um, walk through the problem to yourself. And it's not so embarrassing as uh, actually just talking to yourself. Maybe more embarrassing, I'm not sure. The other reference that uh, someone picked up on that I didn't emphasize is the reference to Dr. Strangelove. OK. But never mind what we're doing today. This isn't Boot Camp 2, this is Boot Camp 4. I've got a link to the Stats Boot Camp 4, and we'll go to that page during this session. Uh, I like metaphors. I've introduced some of them for the past sessions, and the the um, the metaphor for today is the metaphor of R space. So uh, R space is is what I call the um, memory space in your R session when maybe you're reading in your data or you're working with some data objects. R space uh, is a metaphor that helps people to um, to think of data in an abstract way. We often are trained to use um, spreadsheets and, and to visualize them as physical things. In fact, there are digital versions of old fashioned ledgers that uh, maybe accountants of the past would use. Maybe even economists, Carl, I see you in there. Maybe even you would use a ledger. Uh, you're probably far too young to have used a real ledger. But uh, in R space, when we're using R, one of the challenges is, um, is that we don't have that physical representation, that digital representation of a physical thing. And so we have to think abstractly. And my way of doing that is imagine you're floating in R space. And if there is a data object that you can interact with, it will be floating around in R space with you. There's a, a digital representation of that in R studio which we'll have a look at today. I'll remind you to look in the global environment, which is the, the digital representation of this idea of R space. 
And as you know, in our space, no one can hear you scream. Here's what we're going to learn today. Um, we're going to talk about just the basic data types in R. We're going to stop short of data sets because we'll go over reading in your data set next week. Uh, so we'll work with data sets and your own data um, next week. We'll talk about um, the factor data type and just a little bit about how to manipulate that. We'll talk about the class function. As you know, all R functions have a name, um, <clears throat> which is the um, name of the function. And the class function name uh, refers to the type of variable that a, um, some, some data object has and is recognized by R. We know this is a function because all functions um, have a, a open and closing bracket at the end of their, their name. So we'll talk about how to use class and how to convert variables from one variable type to another and maybe talk a little bit about why we might want to do that. We need to think a little bit about um, structures of data that uh, that um, that are computer oriented. So it's real helpful to think of things in terms of vectors. Vectors are just uh, we can think of a vector as a column of data, let's say in an Excel spreadsheet where it's all the measuring the same thing and it's different observations of the same variable like human height. Uh, so human height measured on different subjects might be a vector of data as opposed to a matrix. A matrix um, of data has both rows and columns. Um, uh, and we can talk about arrays, um, whereas a matrix has the two dimensions, rows and columns, an array has more than two dimensions. So we'll talk a little bit about those because it's useful to think of things like that. And then as usual for every page, um, we'll just look at the practice exercises. If we have time, we'll go through them. So, um, so I've said something about the concept of data objects. Anything that we use a computer to work with, uh, whether it's a, a single variable, whether it's a, a constant value in some kind of equation, like like maybe something like the um, the slope of a regression, or a constant like the uh, value of pi, <clears throat> we can think of anything like that as a data object. Uh, we have to think about it, and we have to take a little responsibility for what those are uh, in the R world because we're asking the computer to do calculations upon those. And we can make some assumptions, and we can leave some of the work up to the computer. Um, remember my my metaphor for the R system when we make assumptions and let the computer system make decisions for us. It's a little bit like a a passive aggressive butler. Often it might do exactly what we want. Sometimes it might do something that is not exactly what we want, but it's adequate. And sometimes it might do something that we don't really want and it's unexpected and it's a mistake. And maybe we need to pay attention to that. Now, um, I mentioned the global environment and the we can think of the global environment as this representation of our space where the data we want to use lives in the global environment or lives in our space. And uh, we also want to think about data types. We're going to work with those um, when I look at the code uh, in just a sec. Data types refer to the kind of data, very important for computers. So, you know, I'll go over some of those types. The types are like zeros and ones, which is binary data, or integers. That would be like one, two, three. Or it could be like uh, floating point values, decimal numbers, like uh, 1.6 or 23.8. Those are decimals. We have already looked at those a little bit. Now, um, in some programming languages, the data type uh, must be specified by the user. So you have to know exactly what you're doing. And, and in really old fashioned languages, some of you may have encountered this before, you even have to define how much memory you set aside for holding variables. You have to allocate your own memory. 
But in modern languages like R, all of this stuff is just done automatically. You know, it's done by the passive aggressive butler for better or for worse. And often, you know, 98% of the time, we don't have to do anything else um, for it and it's just fine. But th those 2% of the time are quite annoying. So we need to be aware of some of these things. Um, now you're often gonna wanna tweak data for, for people like most of us who are applied scientists, the time you wanna tweak your data is if you're doing an analysis and let's say you have a factor and uh, the factor, um, maybe you have a control variable and you have some other levels of some factor with the control, we, we often need to tweak that data so that it behaves exactly like we want it. And I'll, I'll give a little example of that just today and we'll carry on with that in the future. <laughs> so this is some R code. I tried to fix it from last uh, week where we had the color coding that didn't show up very well on this. So uh, what we have here is a is a variable name, and we have the assignment operator for R. And then we're using the combine function to create a vector of of numbers. I'm going to go to um, R Studio after this. Um, this is an example of a numeric vector, and uh, I have another example here of a of a so-called logical barrier variable that is. Um, creating a vector of values of true and false. Now, these are special values. These all capital true and all capital false. They have a special value in R uh, as binary variables. And a true is equivalent to one. And true is also equivalent to capital, uh, oops, not capital F. Of course, it's equivalent to capital T in R. Uh, and why are there three ways of um, doing exactly the same thing with binary variables? The reason there are three ways of, of doing binary variables in R, uh, at least the explanation from the creators of R, is that they anticipate people who use this are not going to be computer programmers. So they've given people some logical ways of inter interfacing with the program uh, that, uh, that will just work and you won't have to think about it. The butler will do almost everything. You won't have to think about it. But I still do find that sometimes by creating these different ways of doing things, that it, it actually does create extra confusion. So I'm going to go to um, the, the web page from the bootcamp link. Let's just click on that. And uh, I'm gonna scroll down to the place with these code examples. And I'm just gonna copy that. And I'm going to open a new instance of R Studio. Now, if you want to come along with me and code along with me, I encourage that. Um, some people like to do that, and it, it's fine if you don't want to do that too. You may just want to pay attention and play with the code later. That's fine too. But uh, that's the link in the chat if you do want to navigate down here. You can copy the code. I'm going to open a new instance of R Studio. Let's see what pops up, see if any projects, any cheeky projects try to load themselves. Oh, they do. Look at that. Let's close that project. There we go. I'm going to just close these um, pages and start a new R script. So this is uh, where we are. I'm just going to make it, um, I think it's big enough. Maybe I'll just make it a little bit bigger for everybody. Now, you know, I like to, um, it's best practice to set a header, just like we practiced in previous sessions. And uh, we always want at least the following data um, who, when, and what. So you, know, you can put your own name. This is just a breadcrumb trail. For your future self. Um, now for these boot camp scripts, you um, you it's not so important to leave a breadcrumb trail, perhaps. You, you may not come back to these scripts a lot. 
on the other hand, for any any work that you do with data, it's essential to leave this breadcrumb trail to to tell you, hey, yeah, what what exactly was it? Leave enough good comments, and I've mentioned this before. So for the benefit of people just joining us, and just to um, reiterate the importance of it, always leave in these comments. You're leaving them for a respected person who you haven't had a chance to explain everything to, and there should be enough information here that everything is clear as to what you were getting up to. So um, 2024, 02, today's <clears throat> the 7th, isn't it? Yes. Okay. So um, part one, and I'm going to paste in the code. I've um, forwarded my own paste. There we go. Let's get a good view of this for everybody. See that my um, my um, <clears throat> code is a little too wide for this level of magnification. I'm just going to back off a little bit. Just yell if somebody wants me to keep the um, level of magnification up. OK, so what we're doing here is we're creating our very first vector, our very first numeric vector. And um, I'm just doing this with code like we've done before calling it variable one, assignment operator, combining a bunch of variables, three, two, one, keep your eyes up on the environment, uh, the global environment, it'll pop up up there, three, two, one, there we go. We can see there are 14 values, they're just integers. We actually get a little hint up here of what type of variable it is. It does say um, num up there. I'm gonna make another variable that's a logical variable, three, two, one. And we see the little hint that it's a logical variable. And I'm going to finally make a character vector with the names of some people. Um, three, two, one, pop up up in the global environment. There we go. That's a character vector with three values. I mentioned the class function. Even though we have a visual indicator um, up here, if you have a if you have a data frame or a list that's got a lot of variables in it, which we'll learn about later. <coughs> It's often not very convenient to manually have to look through your global environment. So sometimes we might want to use the class function, the work it does for us, to tell us what the variable type is, and the outputs will come down in here in the console, the bottom. So you can keep your eyes down on the console, and I'm just going to quickly get the types for those three variables: three, two, one, two, three. So we can just see the types. Now this is the um, almost the the bare basics of of what we can do. Um, I'm going to introduce a new metaphor just briefly, and we'll come back to it next week, I think. And that's my um, my metaphor for uh, for vectors and matrices and and how computers think about them. We can think of this this vector as a street. And uh, at each of these places, there's a house. And uh, like in this house lives a value, the value is four. And each of these um, houses has an address. And the address is really easy. It's just uh, a sequence of, of numbers starting at one and going up to the, to the max. There's 14 of them um, here. I know there are 14 of them here because I just remembered that I got that little visual cue up in the uh, global environment. So now I've named my names for these variables. Notice how I named them variable underscore one and variable underscore two. Those are really kind of silly names, but th there are a little rules, a uh, few little rules that we have to keep in mind. Some of the rules are rules that are imposed on us by the butler. Some of them are rules that are best practice to make your code readable by other people and by your future self, reading your old code that you've left behind. So uh, one of them is that um, you, you can name variables anything. You could name them Bob. You can name them Pluto. You can name them, you know, FDNC red number five. They can contain letters. They can contain numbers. And they can contain some symbols, like the underscore that are used there. They must uh, begin with a letter. And um, I say that uh, 
that the name does not contain spaces. They should not contain spaces. I, in the modern R computing language, it is possible to work with um, names with spaces, but you always have to use quotes then, and that makes your code really annoying to read and much harder to type. So I think it's better just to just always say that the name never contains spaces. Some symbols are forbidden, like the at symbol and pound sign and per percentage sign and some others, ampersands, stuff like that, quotes, all of those are forbidden. Um, but really the most important one is this last one. Uh, the butler will tell you very quickly if you're breaking one of the rules. But the, the most important one is that the names of your variables should be human readable. They should have um, information of themselves that is is um, is apparent to a to a human code reader. Your naming conventions. Pick a naming convention. There are, there are no real elements of best practice, but within a project or a script, be consistent. So if you've got a couple of variables. Um, Let's say that um, <clears throat> uh, pertain to soil. You might um, name them something like soil set one, soil set two, or soil set east, soil set west, something like that. The names also shouldn't be too long. Uh, it is a it is a, uh, a tendency, a temptation to uh, name really explicit names like uh, um, soil. Uh, collected by Simon, you know, 2022. That's a totally valid name, but it, it's too long. Every time you use it, your code is going to be that long in chunks, and it'll be really hard to read it. So uh, I like to keep my variable names less than about 10 or 12 characters, um, and even less than that if I can get away with it. <laughs> so we're going to look at um, some of those naming conventions. I'm going to just go back to the um, R page and uh, pull this over. Go back to R. Notice that I'm uh, using that convention when I make these sections where I start with two hashes and I end with four. The reason I'm doing that is it, it creates uh, a uh, clickable contents for long um, scripts that's best in its best practice. So I'm going to paste in what it just did and walk through it, talk you through it. <clears throat> so it's quite a big section. So try this. We're going to look at variable name rules. Um, so I've, I've made a variable called x1. Just put a, a 5 in it. Now x1, if I could critique this, um, it just contains one variable. No problem with the name. It's, it adheres to all the rules. But what is X? What is X1? It has no meaning whatsoever. It's just a variable of convenience, probably a little too terse. Uh, X2 here contains a character string. It was a dark and stormy night. Um, now, it's totally fine. It works. It's, it adheres to the convention. But here another problem arises is that I've named two variables, very similar names, but uh, they don't contain similar kinds of data. There's no relation whatsoever. So we probably want to avoid stuff like that for that exact reason. Then last, I've got one here that I've called my variable 9283467. Nothing wrong with that name. It adheres to all the, um, the conventions. I'm going to just run it. And it pops up up here. It's so long, we can't even see the whole name unless we mouse over it. Now this works, it's technically works, but it's hard to read the name. And it's got that problem that it's too long, it, there's unnecessary you know, numbers in it. it uh, I probably, if I were gonna name something as generic as my variable, I would call it my var. So just so that it was shorter, but it had the same information, that sort of thing. All of the variables must begin with a letter. So uh, we could call a variable varieties that hold a vector, Red Delicious, and Granny Smith character strings. No problem with that. We could call a variable x432, and they could contain some vector. No problem with that. But uh, here's a variable that I've called 22catch. We know that this 
can't work because um, because it violates that rule of starting with a number. Let's see what the error message does. This is a message straight from the passive aggressive butler down in the terminal or uh, in the console. Three, two, one. Error, unexpected symbol, and that symbol was a, a number. But if we just change that, catch 22, no problem. Variable names um, must not contain spaces. Okay, so we have uh, these, my underscore variable um, will echo no problem, three, two, one. My dot variable, no problem, three, two, one. We have this capitalism kind of um, marking. This is, believe it or not, this is a, a controversy in the R world. Uh, and in in any programming language, the controversy is this: that um, if we have capitals and no spaces, uh, there's a name for this. People call this camel case because of the little humps uh, in the uh, in the variable names. And I think they call this Python case or snake case. Um, if we create undulations with underscores or something like that, some people are absolutely rabid that they insist on something like this. And some people think that that underscore just is, is unnecessary because it creates one extra space and that you've got to do it this way. Um, I have to say that I, I tend to um, prefer the underscores myself, but um, both of those are acceptable by, by widely accepted standards. And if you accept and implement one of the widely accepted standards, uh, it'll make your code more readable to other people and therefore more useful to uh, probably to your future self. Let's try it with a space. Um, three, two, one. No, we get an unexpected symbol. Let's try it with quotes around it. Three, two, one. Now, um, I said nope because at the time that I wrote the boot camp, which is about four, five years ago now, um, this was not acceptable in the R world, but there has been an update since then. And actually, it's uh, it's if we look in the R, um, the R um, global environment, <clears throat> it does display now. So it's been a change to the actual core R language that permits this. Very much not recommended, but it actually does work uh, as opposed to when I first did it. Now, finally, um, about the forbidden characters, we'll just try a few. Uh, let's try the uh, at symbol, three, two, one. So uh, that doesn't work. We'll try a minus sign, three, two, one. Also doesn't work because of the um, ambiguity of the math operator, the minus, and then the equal sign, three, two, one. This does work. Now, uh, what's going on here? If we uh, choose my and see what's in it, it's very ambiguous. The space, my, if you can see my mouse over, it's going to be very small for you. It only shows the first word before the space for the quoted variable. And for the actual my, we um, actually get a value for the characters m, y, and we get a one. Now, I put a nope here because I think this is another change that has crept into R. In the old days, the original creators of um, R, of R, the language R, would never have allowed this. And this is this is terrible. This is what the butler has done to us. He's allowed this to happen as a trick. What has happened here is this whole expression has been treated like um, a single line. The regular R assignment operator has um, put the the value of one into the variable called var, and then the equal sign operator. Now, this does work as an assignment operator. And what it does is it assigns the value of the thing on the right to the thing on the left, just like we might expect it to in any computing language. But usually in R, it's reserved for only being used inside of functions. But here, it also does work outside of functions. And here, it's past that function um, of the assignment operator onto the variable my, it's created a variable my, and it's passed the, it's assigned the, uh, this whole line is assigned the value of one to the variable called var, then it's assigned the value of the variable called var to the variable called my. Okay, very tricky. And I really don't like this at all that we see the visual representation 
of the two mys. So we want to stick to these rules. Finally, we want our um, variables to be human readable. So we have a um, diameter at breast height centimeters in a snake case. This works perfectly well. That is a perfectly good name. There's no problem, but it is a bit long. I've written a little bit of a note. It's legal, but you know, for my my own personal style, too long. Um, maybe a better one would be dbh underscore cm. That's much better. Uh, works just as well. Height um, and case sensitivity. So if we make this variable called height. Um, this is an important one. And this is one that's real frustrating when you start using. Now, if we ask the butler, hey, what's inside of the variable height? But we spelled it with a um, capital H. Look down in the console, three, two, one. The object height is not found. But if we use the lowercase, no problem. It tells us what's in the variable. OK, that was very quick. And you know, the idea here is that um, I'll demonstrate how it works and you go through this code on your own later, or if you're quick enough, maybe you've kept up um, with that and you can you can get something from it. Now, I wanted to say something about factors. They're a special kind of data that a lot of applied scientists use when they're doing statistics. Um, so we have to deal with them and we'll be dealing with them from the very first time you read in a data set usually. So even next week, we'll deal with our first factors in a real data set. So, um, you know, usually we want to analyze some categorical data when we're talking about factors. And uh, but a factor in the R world has a special meaning. You know, th this is typical kind of data where we've got um, observations of life expectancy on the Y axis over here <clears throat> for different countries. And we're treating the different countries as subsets of a factor with uh, continents as a um, or at least large regions as a as a factor. So this is a categorical variable um, down here by um, by continent or region. So th this would be an example of what we would analyze maybe within a, an analysis of variance or something. So this factor type is um, real important. We work with it right from from the simplest traditional statistics up to the uh, most complicated models. There are a lot of types of factors, but two broad categories are ones that are non-ordered. So they might be names of, of uh, entities that don't have a particular order, like the names of, of cows where we've measured things repeatedly on them, like Martha, Ruth, and Edith. But uh, we might have non-ordered I mean, uh, ordered factors that do have a specific order. In this case, it might be something like a dose where you have a control uh, level of the factor where there is um, a placebo or, or a zero amount or a very small amount. And then maybe you have some ordered um, factor like a, a half dose and a full dose or you know maybe many more, a lot of field trials um, would have something like this um, too. And you, you can have mixes of these kinds of variables too. So we need a way to specify in the R world what they're like. And uh, we, we do this in a variety of ways. So I'm going to start off showing a, um, a non-ordered factor. And I'm just entering these as, um, as characters. And the levels are uh, short, uh, early, and uh, hybrid. You know, they're not ordered at all. Let's go back over to the R page and grab that code. Here it is. Just remember my naming convention. We'll carry on with um, section three. Okay, so um, I'm just going to clear my workspace so that we can see the workspace over here with a new variable. So I'm going to create this variable. It's going to pop up here. It's going to be called variety, and it's going to be a character type variable, 3, 2, 1. And it's got nine levels. And uh, we can examine the class. We know it's a character from the environment, but remember, we like to use the class function sometimes. So we can look down in the console and see what class, 3, 2, 1. 
we can uh, print the contents of variety just in the normal way by submitting the name of our variable to the R system. So three, two, one. <clears throat> I'm submitting these, by the way, for people that are new. Yes, it does. That's a good uh, observation, um, Tim. By default, the um, the of uh, of uh, a uh, factor. Maybe I have an example of this in a second. We'll see that they'll sort by um, by alphabetical order. If we if we print out a character string, it prints them out in the order that they've been entered into the vector. But sure enough, um, if we make it into a factor. Here I'm using the factor function, I'm passing our character vector variety to the factor function, and that's going to convert the class of that variable to a factor. Three, two, one. You can see it up here. This will flip and it'll be called a factor. Three, two, one. Factor with three levels. And if we make the class down in the, um, the uh, console, we can see now it's a factor. And if we print it out, just as um, Tim pointed out, the um, the order of the levels is sorted by alphabetical. Now that affects um, that affects some things like when we're making a graph, it affects the order that the levels are displayed on a graph. Um, I mean, the order of the actual values is the same order that. Um, that uh, they're entered, I think, or has that shifted around as well? No, it hasn't shifted. I thought it would be the order that they're they're entered, but it's the um, the levels that are sorted by um, by uh, alphabetical order. Now we can manipulate that. Uh, I don't think I'm going to do that today. We'll do that in a future session. But we often will want to manipulate that. It's one of many things we'll want to manipulate so that say the control comes first, even if it's alpha theoretically not the, the first one. We also want to do that for analysis reasons, because um, oftentimes um, subsequent levels to a reference variable, it's a little bit of statistics jargon, we're jumping ahead, um, contrasts are calculated relative to a reference variable. And if we don't tell the butler uh, what the reference variable is, the first one by alphabetical order is the reference level. So it is important to uh, to do this, but that's for a future time. Now, uh, we can manipulate ordered factors. So I guess I do introduce that now. I'm just going to go back to the section and paste this code in. So here I'm making a new factor called day with the days of the week, some days of the week, three, two, one. Just a character. I'm going to look at the class. Down in the console, three, two, one is a character. But I'm going to make it a factor, three, two, one, be the class. So now day is recognized as a factor and the class is a factor. And if I print it out, um, we'll see, sure enough, that uh, the order of the levels is alphabetical. But uh, we don't really usually want to do that um, for the reasons that I just said. And in this case, it's obvious that we might want them uh, in the chronological order of days of the week. So to do that, we can use the help function. I've said this every session so far, and I'll continue to say it, that um, when we want to learn how to use a function, the first stop is always the help page for the function. I've gone through this before. So we want to understand um, how to manipulate the behavior of the factor function. So let's bring up the help on the factor page. We can um, see that there are a couple of arguments in here. Um, can't make this much bigger uh, as it is, but um, there's a levels argument and there's an ordered argument here. And if we come down, we look and see that the levels argument is, a, is an optional vector of the unique values of character strings of the character strings um, that your your variable x would take. So it's the same names as the levels. We have another one for labels, and then we have an ordered 
one where we can specify that it is an ordered variable or it's not. So um, all of these all of these are things that we can manipulate. The one that I'm going to show you today is the levels one. So if we set the levels arg argument to a different order than um, than alphabetical. So here at the moment we see that it's Monday, Thursday, Tuesday, Wednesday, but we want it to be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So if I use the levels argument to specify that day, if you just keep your eye up here, you'll have to be canny. Notice the value of Monday, it won't change. If I pull it out just a little bit, we'll be able to see that little Thursday creeping in there and that should change the order of that's recognized of the variable levels to Tuesday, three, two, one. So it did. And if we just print that out again, we have um, <clears throat> we've told the butler how it should be, and he's he's done it finally. Okay, now we're going to talk about the vectors. We'll talk more about these next week. Just introducing these as a variable time. See you, Sophie. Yeah. Um, you can add a. That's a that's a um, that's a trick as whole, old as the hills, Anna, to um, alphabetically name your variable levels in the first place. And I guess if that's the way you want to do it, you can do it that way. There's nothing wrong with that, actually. There's nothing wrong with that, actually. Sometimes it it might subvert the. You know, if you wanted to make a nice graph, and uh, you had like a underscore control and b underscore west and C underscore East or something like that. You know, there are reasons to want to manipulate the names such as they are, but uh, but actually there's nothing wrong with it if you want to just have a peek at the data and it is very logical. And I have to say that I'm guilty of doing that quite often myself. Um, okay. <clears throat> so what we're going to talk about is um, we're going to look at some code to create and manipulate vectors. So these, if we're thinking technically about it, we can name a vector, you know, like here it might be called uh, my underscore vec. And um, a new thing that I'm introducing here is a new kind of notation, the uh, bracket notation, square brackets. And uh, here, um, if you have a vector and the dimension of the vector is, let's say that I is 14, like in the vector we made before, then um, the the vector here, we can access the values from the address of the slots where each of the values live. And we do that in a vector in one dimension in the square brackets notation. And we can grab all of the vectors by their address if we specify a range of addresses uh, or, or just one. There are lots of little tricks we can do with it. Why would we want to do that? Well, at the moment, just accept that it can be done, but we'll, when we want to subset our data frame, um, if we have some data and we want to um, take out, you know, like just one single year of yield data, um, this, this is the way we manipulate it. So it's a concept that we'll build on later. So if you can accept that, I'll just go on and say that matrices are two dimensions and that they're characterized as having what we think of as rows and columns. They're not exactly the same as a data set because a data set might have a column of that's a factor, a column that's a number, and a column that's binary data, a column that's a date, it could have all kinds of data in it. But a matrix is two dimensional and has only one kind of data object. So it would all have to be integers, all have to be decimal numbers, all have to be logical numbers. They have um, two indices in their square brackets and we call the rows the i dimension and the columns the j dimension and we can slice them by specifying those same way arrays are just uh, data objects that have more than two dimensions so we might have i j and k for that and we can have as many as you want as many conceptually as as you can handle r can do it so let's look at a little data Data blast here. I'm just going to copy that. We're up to section four.
Okay, so um, <clears throat> so we're going to make a vector. I'm just going to clean this out a little bit, clear my screen down here. So um, I'm just going to make a vector, and I'm just going to um, um, call it vector. Three, two, one. This will be a numeric vector because I'm um, filling it with numbers. Three, two, one. Boop, boop, boop. Okay, so I've made my vector. I've um, specified it here. I've said the um, name of the data object, and the butler has repeated the contents of that vector. And then I've used the class function. It's told me it's a numeric vector. Now here's one where we manipulate the um, the variable type. <clears throat> there are many ways of manipulating it, but one way, let's say that I don't really want these to be numbers. I want them to be um, the character five and the character four and so on. So we can use a function to do that work for us. And uh, the way we convert characters from one type to another uh, usually begins with the type we want to convert to and the, the characters as dot. So if you want to um, cast the data in this vector, my vec1, as a character, we would use the as.character function. So what I'm going to do is um, convert it, print it out, and see the class all down in the console, three, two, one. Sure enough, now the uh, numbers are printed out with quotes. They are, in fact, recognized as characters in the class of the variables of vector. What happens if I um, if I try to make a new vector, vector three, and I try to do variables of two different types, two numbers and a, and a character string? Check this out, three, two, one, and then I print it out. What has happened is the butler has said, uh, oh, you're trying to combine and make a vector that has two numbers and a character string. Sir must mean that you want a, all of the variables to be uh, character strings because male is not a number. So the uh, passive aggressive butler has just guessed that what you actually want uh, fits within the rules of R space that you can only have one variable type in your vector and it's, he's done it on the fly. We can, we can convert the vector to numeric with as.numeric. Let's see what happens, three, two, one. Here it says, uh, you know, Sir insists on converting the character string M-A-L-E into a number, but that's not possible. So you get a missing value. Okay, so these are some of the situations that they arise quite, quite regularly when we need to manipulate our data with code that we have to watch out for. Okay. So um, <clears throat> I think I continue on with um, the, the vector, and I'm going to show a few tricks and uh, show about the matrix variable type. I'm just conscious of time where we only have a little bit of time, but we have enough to, um, to get through the, um, the code. So I'm just going to copy this one and continue on. So I'm going to clear my clear my screens here. So uh, one of the things that I'm going to do is I'm going to make a, um, a variable called vec1. Just print it out. So there's 16 numbers, consecutive numbers, 1 to 16. And uh, we're going to use that as a baseline to create our first matrix. So we can kind of look up the help page. Remember, if you're using a function for the first time, it's always, even though the help pages look a little bit ugly, the thing we always get is we get a, um, a usage of all the different kinds of um, arguments that can we can manipulate to um, alter the behavior of the function. So it instantly tells us a little bit of information about how the function works. Of course, we may be able to guess what some of the arguments mean, like in row. What do you think that means? It means the number of rows for the matrix you want. And uh, by default, these values are one and one, unless you specify something different. 
So uh, if you don't know what the names of like what by row means, we have the argument dictionary <clears throat> and uh, we can read about it. What by row happens to mean is uh, it happens to mean whether you want to fill a matrix by the rows or by default, it will fill it by the columns. And so this is something you have to play with maybe to get a feel for. But uh, if, I, if I make this a little bit easier to read like this, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a matrix that I call mat1. Use the matrix function. For the input data for the data argument over here, I'm going to set it equal to our VEC1 we just made, the numbers 1 to 16. For the number of columns in the matrix, I'm going to set that to 4. Uh, if there are four columns and there are um, 16 values, that will mean that we have four rows by default. And do I want it to enter by um, by row? You know, and I, I've left that at the um, at the default of false, but I've made it explicit here, so it's clear what's happening. So what that should do is it should make a make a matrix with four columns and four rows, and it should fill them one two, three, four, and then start up at the next column, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so we can um, just print that out. And that is what we get, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and so forth. There's a couple of things to notice here. One is that <clears throat> up here is that, that notation, the square brackets, and uh, here we see a comma four. That means that um, for this column, remember the second number is the J, which is the column indicator in a matrix. It's rows, comma, columns. That means this is the fourth column and the blank um, here before the, the comma. The blank implies that um, we want all of the rows. So we see all the rows of the fourth column, all the rows of the third column, Rows are the same way. We see all the columns of the first row in that dimension. Now we can put names on these columns and rows. So for example, we can look at the call names function and it will tell us the names of the function of the of our matrix, matrix one, mat one, three, two, one. So there are no names. It's null. They don't contain any names. So what we can do is we can say, right. I want to put some names in the object that's defined by call names mat1. Maybe I want to name my column names A, B, C, and D. So I can put them into the call names mat1. I'm going to do that and print it out again. Three, two, one. Now the call names are listed as A, B, C, D. And if I print out the matrix again, three, two, one, now we see the column names. This is so convenient. Um, to do. It's like one of those small things, but it is awkward to figure out the first time. So just showing you what it's like. You may need to figure it out again when you need to do it next. And the uh, the last one that I have is a challenge. We're just out of time, but if people want to just see the challenge, I'll go ahead and do it. You can think about this, and I'm not giving any spoilers because um, because um, you still have the exercises to go through on your own. And uh, by the way, if anybody has questions from past exercises, we can do that in the beginning. I forgot to ask today, but I usually will ask right at the beginning. So the challenge one is to set the row names for mat one using the row names function. I've capitalized that incorrectly. So it's case specific. So if I um, if I do this, and I see what the row names are for mat1. We can see that there are no row names. So I can do something similar to what I did up here, set the row names. I can name the rows anything I want. They'll be character strings. So I can um, name the rows um, north, south, east, and west. then print out mat1 
And now I can see that my rows have names. Sometimes we want the rows to have names and sometimes it doesn't matter. Um, but there, there are some times where row names are set, but the row names are annoying and we want to get rid of them. So uh, I'll just show a little extra challenge here. So if we want to get rid of the row names, I'm going to recycle this code, copy row names. We can put null into the row names. And then we can print out our matrix. And we can see that we've gotten rid of them. So this is just having the facility to, to impact the world, change the way the world works. And our challenge two is to make a matrix with three rows with the following vector. So the first column contains the numbers uh, two, five, and nine in that order, or rows one, two, and three respectively. So uh, let's go ahead and make this vector. See that there are 12 numbers. The task is to make three rows. Okay, so let's, let's try it out. Let's try it out really fast without even thinking about it. We can use the matrix call this um, mat2, use the matrix function like we did above. A lot of the idea for these and the exercises, as you know, if you've tried them, is it'll demonstrate how to do certain things and then ask you to do small variations on them. So if we set vec2 and I specify that there were three rows, let's just see what happens. Oops, I need back two, three, two, one. And we can print it out. And um, now it said the first column should contain the numbers two, five, and nine in that order. But this first column contains two, three, and five. And that's because, remember, the, um, the default for by row is false. So it filled in two, three, five, um, by doing the column first um, by default. So uh, if we were to fill the um, the rows true by default, this first row would contain two, three, five, and four. Remember, I wanted uh, two, five, and nine in the first rows. So the first row would have a two, then the second row would have a five, then the third row would have a nine, two, five, nine. So the idea of this is to kind of figure out that uh, by row should be set to true. So let's just add that in. I'm just gonna use the shorthand. I'm gonna print it out three, two, one, print out our matrix, and that has filled the matrix differently. We can see both of them if I just make it a little bit bigger. This is filled based on this vector um, by rows in that order. Now we went pretty fast and we're out of time. Any comments or questions? <laughs> and I'll, uh, I'll bid you good night if there aren't any. But uh, the idea for these, for the new folks, is that you then go back and spend a little time running the code yourself and attempt these practice exercises. They're at the the bottom of um, of every spreadsheet of every one of the pages. <clears throat> and if we go back to the page, the practice exercises are are just small questions that uh, that can build on the code that uh, you would have typed and run yourself to get the most out of this boot camp. As you know, you you'll need to run the code yourself to uh, to see how it works. I recommend typing the code yourself. You can copy and paste if uh, typing it is too much for you. But uh, if you type it, you'll probably make some small typographical errors. And by doing so, you'll learn. You'll get feedback from the butler and, uh, and learn. Bye, Katarina. Guys, um, if there aren't any questions, I'm going to pull the plug because I've been on Teams running my short course uh, on databases this week, and I've, I feel like I've been talking for eight hours because I have been talking for eight hours. I'm going to have a drink, uh, a drink I should, um, of apple juice, <laughs> and uh, then I'm going to go home. So I'll see everyone later.
Have a good night. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. Good night, everyone. Thanks, Ed. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.